<laughs> All right, so uh, floor was pretty short this morning. So that leaves us some time to get some committee discussion in this morning. Um, and so I just wanted to open up the conversation to, uh, to have a little committee discussion. But before we do that, I wanna orient you to the fact that the speaker had a press conference this morning at nine. Um, in the press conference, uh, she, uh, she acknowledged that, um, that we're hearing a lot of feedback from stakeholders about slowing down, about taking the time to, to hear and engage. And so she is, um, she is giving us uh, an assignment to work towards some sort of interim committee or task force that will um, continue the work that we've been doing uh, with engaging in, um, you know, I think, I think the way she framed it was really sort of an open, I mean, it sounded like she uh, was really kind of acknowledging all the ideas that were put on the table yesterday and wanting to make sure that we uh, set up a process for all ideas to be considered in this interim uh, task force setting. Um, and she would like us to continue to work forward on governance, which I think, um, given the proposal that was put before us yesterday, I think really brings us um, much further along the road in terms of uh, finding some consensus changes to the the way the pension system is governed and the transparency requirements and um, uh, and and some of those issues. And uh, with respect to the 150 million, um, she wants uh, the legislature to put that in reserve and to hold on to it for uh, for inclusion in the discussion when we find a way to move forward with all four pension buckets. And so just we've spent a lot of time in the last um, week and a half talking about um, the teachers and state employees pension shortfalls, but we also have that lingering challenge of um, of needing to figure out how to pre-fund teachers and state employees healthcare retiree benefits or OPEB benefits. And so those are the four buckets. Um, so I just wanted to open up for committee discussion about, uh, about that. If you wanna start by talking about the governance proposal that we heard yesterday, um, let's, let's talk for a few minutes about governance and then um, after we have a chance to talk for a few minutes about governance, um, we can talk a bit about what we think that interim um, task force or committee might look like. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First, a, a question on, I don't even know what to call this. The speaker has uh, said, I'd like you to, I'd like you to, does that mean that's where we're going, or are we still a committee that has broad range in what we're gonna talk about and do? I, I mean, is this an edict, I guess, is the question. Because <laughs> there's a uh, lot of stuff, there's a lot of moving pieces here still. There are a lot of moving pieces here. And, um, and so she has said, move forward with governance. And she has said, move forward with creating a, a task force or interim committee to talk about revenue, plan design, benefit changes, employee contributions, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as the 150, I have a tendency to think that the sooner that gets to where it's supposed to go, the better. It's uh, part of a funding computation that will come back at some point. And as far as the governance thing, yesterday was kind of weird for me as somebody that, you know, last night got about a million emails from VPIC affiliated people with what was going on. That was a couple of individuals and I don't think we should move forward on any conversation with governance until we actually hear from the VPIC itself. There's a certain element of, and I'm just gonna be frank, um, we need to do something before VPIC gets destroyed here because there was the impression that there was a clear agenda um, that may have unintended consequences. So before we start off on this role, I think there's going to be a special meeting 
there would be a formal response from the actual organization, um, I would think that would be important to wait and listen to. Um, well, the bill's not going to pop out of here on Tuesday. I can guarantee that. Um, no, no, no. I, I see a little be bit. On just want to be on record if you don't. I, and as far as the task force goes, that's I think that's the clear solution to progress. So I think it's a little over dramatic to suggest that what was presented to us yesterday by Tom Galanka and Beth Pierce is destroying VPIC. Um, no, that is not what I said. That is not my intention, put it that way. And I'll go back to my comment that English is not always my primary language. But the, the idea that the initial proposal that we quote unquote still have on the table was uh, pretty radical is, is what I think drove them to come yesterday and present something as an alternative. And it would be my intention to use that alternative as the starting point for what we consider going forward since um, <clears throat> ours was an initial uh, conversation starter and it seems like a relevant response to that that the chair of VPIC and the state treasurer collaborated to bring us a presentation. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> you know, I, I have to agree with the speaker that working on governance is critically important and that we shouldn't delay working on it. Um, it's one of the things we do have control over as a legislature um, is changing governance and, and ensuring, um, especially with the VPIC, that we get the type of investment performance um, and the type of analysis with respect to assumed rates of return that we need desperately um, to stabilize our pensions. Um, we have seen what's happened when there is poor, poor, poor performance and overly optimistic assumed rates of return. I don't wanna go back to those days um, at all. So I, I think this is critically important work to get done as soon as we, we can, to talk to all the, the, the people that we need to talk to and take testimony from. But I, I really think it is critical and I really appreciate the work of the VPIC chair, Tom Galanka, and our treasurer, Beth Pierce, in putting together a thoughtful starting point for us to have this discussion. Tanya Bihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would really just like to reiterate what I said yesterday that I'd like to hear from the boards that that send members to VPIC, so the various retirement boards. So I think it's the VMERS board, the VSTERS board, and the state employees board to hear their take on this. And I do want to make sure that they continue to have a voice in this process. Thank you. Anyone else? Mike Merwicki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to add, add that um, I too feel that this is an area that we, we need to move forward on. Uh, among the many things that we heard in those public hearings is there's little to no confidence in the decisions that, that were being made by these pension boards, uh, including that many people didn't know who was even on the boards. And I think we need to do a better job of educating them. We need to do a, a better job of, of uh, helping that process be more, more open and transparent. So uh, the people affected know what's going on and, and that the public has the confidence in it as well. Mark Higley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd mentioned it yesterday as well about uh, possibly having Jim Voitko. Is that how you pronounce the last name? So yes. from RVK, uh, right, the general <laughs> consultant of VPIC uh, and, and pick his brain a little bit more. I really felt that, uh, you know, he had initially talked about, you know, that they he believes that they're currently doing a good job, best practices and so on. But uh, I certainly, he was a very knowledgeable individual and um, I would certainly uh, appreciate hearing from him again, if, if, if at all possible. Um, on another note, while I'm thinking of it too, I mentioned this yesterday as well. Um, so H315, the bill that seems to be postponed into the abyss. Um, there is that section in there that talks about 20 
uh, million set aside for OPAB and also the provision of us having something together by May 30th. And I'm just, if the speaker has suggested what she has suggested, are, are you or, or us gonna make sure that that gets removed from 315? It is my understanding, and I will definitely check on it, <clears throat> that that 20 million in H315 is a part of the 150 million that the speaker had, um, had said she was setting aside to work on the four buckets. And so um, we will definitely loop back with the appropriations committee to make sure that uh, whichever train is leaving the station last accounts for all of it and makes sure that it is, um, that it's all, you know, left in a, a place where we can come back to it when we have agreement on how to move forward with the whole package. And, and the other piece in that uh, as well, so the May 30th deadline? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a month ago or whenever we passed H315 out of the house the first time, um, we were hoping we would have some more sense of how to move forward on OPEB. Um, and so that's obviously not gonna be a May 30th deadline at this point, because we're setting up a, a task force or interim committee. Right, uh, again though, my understanding, even that piece that was in there wasn't just about OPEB though, correct? Um, I'm not sure. I, okay. I guess I thought that we had, I thought we had sort of walled that off as being part of the OPEB fix, but, um, the, the conversation evolved to wanting to put together a large pot of money to, to fix the whole pension problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mike McCarthy. Yeah, I just, I can't speak to the language in, in 315, but what I will say is that the speaker made it really clear that the $150 million that we had parked in the budget that passed the house is going to stay in reserve under the, the plan that she's suggested this morning. And um, the other thing that I wanted to, to highlight, just to add to what the chair um, told us um, in her very accurate summary of what the speaker was saying, is the acknowledgement that you know any ideas that are brought to the table uh, need support and in order to understand what the consequences and benefits are, are going to be if we make reforms. And um, the task force that she recommended is gonna need you know, support. Um, and that, that is you know, a, another piece of what she mentioned this morning. But in terms of the governance plan, I mean, I think there's, from the testimony that I've heard, uh, a desire to have you know, more expert uh, professionalism, uh, financial expertise and independence are all the things that, you know, we've, we've kind of heard and um, I'm looking forward to continuing working on that. Yep. <laughs> I um, also am, am looking forward to digging in deeper into this conversation. And I do, I really heard the call from lots of people from the, the public testimony from the speaker for transparency. And I do hope that we will consider the model legislation um, from California on really building out a, a plan for transparency going forward with whatever we do. Anything else for committee discussion with respect to governance? A few of you have been weighing in. How? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I have a, a clarifying question. Um, what is our timeline for um, considering and I guess creating this this bill that's going to address the governance issues? Um, what that look like? I think we should pursue it as directly and as swiftly as we can while making time to hear from all the different uh, people and entities that we uh, need to hear from because the reality is we need to get something over to the Senate that they can uh, have time to work on. And I did talk with uh, my Senate counterpart yesterday and she said that it was her goal to 
move through the, the house bills that she has on the wall so that when we get a uh, pensions um, bill over to them, they will be able to focus on it because they will be done with, um, with the house bills that we sent over prior to crossover. So there is still um, a desire to, to be collaborative, um, you know, in terms of, their, you know, they're, they're not, they're going to give a crossover exemption to this bill that we're sending over there, but I think we need to work on it as swiftly as possible. And so I guess I hope if folks have other ideas about governance, either principles or specific um, recommendations with respect to governance, that they reach out to members of the committee uh, ASAP so that we can try to start developing bill language next week. And in addition to that, I hope we can uh, attract any experts out there in the field who can speak to best practices of governance yeah. so we can be better informed. Yeah, and I think um, Voitko, who spent a little bit of time with us earlier this week, um, is, is someone who has a lot of experience working with um, the governance in other states. So, um, you know, so he, he has a lot of uh, information on that um, and we'll be able to probably take a look at what we're looking at and, and uh, give us his reflections if, if we ask him to. Thank you. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what we have been hearing a lot when people come in to testify is that they haven't had time to go back to their prospective boards or committees um, and that they're just giving like a preliminary feeling. Um, and so this was uh, going off of what Representative Colston said, but I feel like people are not, um, they, that a deadline is much more helpful for them of when we're expecting things to happen. So that way people maybe can hold those emergency meetings um, because I, with all respect to people coming in and giving their, giving their side, it's very, very helpful for us to have that knowledge. But when you come in and you say you haven't talked to the people who will be affected, that's not also not helpful for us either because we, you know, we want to know and we want to hear that. Um, so I do appreciate a deadline or like a timeline for things um, because I think that's what people are asking for. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, um, and I, you know, I haven't had a whole lot of time to, to digest the, um, you know, the reality of working towards a governance and task force uh, bill. Um, and so I will, uh, I will certainly begin working on that as soon as we're done here in committee today. And, um, and I very much appreciate that there's a lot of folks around this table who are echoing that we, we would like to have engagement from the different boards and groups that, that uh, are impacted by this. And, and in the case of governance, the folks who are actually currently involved. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep asking for their uh, input on it. Mark? Thank you. Uh, um, not that we shouldn't do our due diligence for sure, uh, but I just think it's important. Uh, the uh, other body has not been very kind to many of the bills that have been sent over there. Um, and uh, uh, I would just, uh, again, the time sensitivity in this, um, maybe we could include at least a uh, preliminary joint uh, GovOps Senate uh, meeting with us. Um, and again, uh, just to, you know, expedite, expedite the process in, in a sense, just, just a thought. Thanks for that suggestion. I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do with that. That, that would be a, a measure of efficiency, wouldn't it? If we were working alongside each other. Uh, Tanya. This is sort of kind of related to governance, so bear with me. Um, I do agree that we need to look at the structure and I would hope that we would also still consider a full audit of the pension to really look at where things went wrong and really understand kind of how the path seems really murky to me. And so I, I do still wanna advocate that alongside this, this work, we, we look at the full scope. 
So I um, I heard that loud and clear. And yesterday in the in the morning session when we had all the ideas on the table, one of the questions that I had asked back to someone who'd contacted me with that concept earlier in the week is, do we have a sense of what that would cost? And is the, uh, I mean, the, the proposal yesterday was that the auditor would uh, would oversee that. And uh, has anyone contacted the auditor to find out how much it would cost, how long it would take, and, um, you know, do yeah, they so need anything from us? My understanding is that the auditor has been contacted and would need to contract some, to oversee it and contract someone in. I don't know the cost, and it sounded like um, the time frame sort of depends on when we get moving, and so he doesn't have the staff to do it, but yes, he is willing to oversee it, and I perhaps perhaps we should bring him in to to hash through it. But yes, we have talked to him. Well, let's hope he's got a sense of what it costs and whether that's something that can be borne within his budget or whether it's going to be a different um, an additional revenue. Um, Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, so it seems like we're on a, an express route here and. I don't know that that's going to coordinate with what VPIC already has, I think, an RFP out for a, an, a, an examination of best practice in terms of what's actually happening. Uh, spending money for nothing, if it's moot, comes to mind. Uh, are we going to interact somehow? I don't remember that Tom or Beth said anything about timeline yesterday. I might have missed it, though. So that's an issue for me anyway. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Am I to understand that the um, proposal as it uh, evolves uh, in a committee on governance would be part of a single bill that involved uh, the fleshing out of the meaning of tax force or would there be two proposals uh, to be considered and sent to the Senate separately? I would prefer to do these in the form of one bill. I just again want to get a sense as to where the difficulties and the attenuation, pardon me, of time <laughs> might lie and one bill will with both of those may be longer in the gestation than um, just the one, but I had to ask. My other, um, I wanted to continue a line of um, observation from yesterday. I identified three areas where I wanted to inquire of Mr. Galanka um, our, and our um, consultant person and the treasurer. The last of those uh, areas uh, came under the rubric of balance. <clears throat> and uh, as you've always urged uh, members, including myself, to bring our real life experiences to the table, so to say, uh, I will now do so. Uh, my work uh, some time ago at 40 Wall Street and um, a rather long set of decades <clears throat> I spent as a um, participant uh, in academia, um, in economics with a business department left me with the following realistic uh, understanding. Most um, uh, business oriented, investment oriented experts in I think the most uh, both generous but purposeful sense of the word, uh, I'd have said something like one in five had a balanced view of the relationship between labor and capital, <clears throat> which in a uh, more uh, polite society is called employee and employer relations. And that's why I asked the balance question. Um, it's very difficult in my experience to find an expert who has a fulsome respect and willingness to participate in, um, how shall I say, uh, equal participation of employer, employer, employee, employer perspectives. So I asked that, and and I just will carry that ahead as we move into 
um, bringing more precision and more detail to the proposal. I enjoyed hearing the proposal. I thought it had a lot of good stuff to it, but I had to fixate on that, um, partly because I'm sure that participants in the task force will also be looking at balance as we move forward. Thank you, Madam. Mark. Thank you. Uh, this is a disclaimer in advance of what I'm to say. Again, this is uh, in jest. Uh, I don't know if others had seen it, but I just remember in the back of my mind years back, a news story that uh, uh, a dart thrower went up against a, uh, a Wall Street expert in regards to uh, investments in the dart thrower one. Well, you're not Justin, exactly painting a very Justin, rosy picture of any improvement we might make by beefing up the governance structure. <laughs> in jest, in jest. Okay. I think that's uh, the argument for index funds and not risky investments, because I think you're right sometimes. It's, it's almost like meteorology. All right, any other committee discussion on governance? All right. Well, let's uh, switch gears then and talk a little bit about um, the concept of a interim committee or task force. Um, I guess it's a nice segue because Peter was just talking about balance and I'm sure that balance on this uh, interim uh, process will be important as well. So open it up to committee discussion on on what that might look like. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I guess to start off with, I, I would just say it's, it's, it's probably going to at least start out and maybe end up with a fairly large number. Um, if, if you ask me uh, again, um, I, I would think it would have to be reps from VMERS and, and the teachers union and uh, VSEA. Uh, VPIC, um, and then of course, uh, I, I don't know how we'd work it um, on the legislative end of things, but uh, um, you know that's that that's a start. Uh, I, I'm sure, you know, we just got. I guess ought to just start scratching down who we think, and then uh, reach out to others as well who have have an opinion. I guess, but it, it, to me, it looks like it could be rather a large task force. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's two pieces. Um, from the little I know of group dynamics, I think a group bigger than 12 is not gonna be a good working group. And I know there's gonna be lots of hands that wanna get, get into this, but this needs to be a working group that does some serious work. The other thing I would suggest is that, that the group hires uh, an outside facilitator that's not a part of the board that can uh, keep people on task and is, is not invested so much one way or the other. And, and that is uh, uh, skilled at, at uh, facilitating. Thanks, Mike. Tanya? Thank you. Um, I definitely echo the importance of balance. Um, and I think we were offered sort of two lists in proposals yesterday. And I would recommend, I, I think sort of look, I, I want to spend some time looking at them and sort of sifting through them. Um, but I do think it is important that we have that, that balance between um, employee and employer representation. Um, but I also, I, I do recognize that I, at least one of the lists, I think, I think it was Representative Higley pointed out would be over 30 people, which feels like it's really big. Um, but I kind of, part of me really wants to go spend some time sifting through all the representation that was that was offered up to see who should be there. And I do think it makes sense, um, perhaps not a voting member, but but a member that sort of has some voice would be the school board association. Cause I do think the impact, some of what we're talking about will impact school budgets, which then goes down to the, the taxpayer in, in another place. So I do think their voice is important at some point along the way, if not fully on that, that committee. 
Yeah. And as I was sort of imagining this in my foggy, just rolling out of bed brain this morning, um, you know, the, the question occurs to me is, you know, do you keep this group um, very small and nimble and then direct them to take input from all of the different stakeholders or do you make a really big table and put all of those various stakeholders at it? Because I think if I do a quick tally right now of what I've heard, we're looking at, you know, more than a dozen, more than a dozen members of the, of this. So I think uh, it's worth doing some thinking about uh, about the pros and cons of uh, nimble and focused versus uh, everybody at the table. So, uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I've been sitting back thinking about a lot of this this morning. Um, one, unlike some other people, I did not get a chance to see the speakers press conference, but um, around this particular issue, um, I support the concept of what we're going to do here and have, sounds like however you want to classify it as a group of people going to be working around this other issue other than governance. As somebody who has spent decades in organized labor and has negotiated a lot of different contracts in a lot of different environments, what I would like to see is that anybody who's got anything to add to this conversation is in the room around the table. We give them a timeline. My preference would be, and I think, I don't know, was Tanya or somebody had alluded to, I'd like to see whatever this issue is at work that's got to be dealt with, it be dealt with in this fiscal year. And I want to see this group of folks have every resource available to them that they need. You know, when I heard yesterday that the teacher's pension is losing $13 million a month, I'd be happy to put $12,900,000 towards getting this issue resolved to save the $100,000 that month so we can get this thing resolve going forward. May sound a little odd, but my heart goes out to all these people that are part of these pensions. These pensions wind up being a major issue every 10 years, it seems. So clearly the solutions that have been brought forward haven't really worked out in the long term. And I really think that we owe it to them and we owe it to the Vermont taxpayers to help get this worked out. Clearly the process that happened before this came to our committee wasn't the right process. The people that should have been at the table weren't. So I totally support this, but I don't think that it's our job to be that prescriptive about who and how many. I think there's a lot of talented people there and a lot of the contract negotiations I've been involved at, there has been dozens of people in the room, not necessarily everybody at the table, but you need as many different people were there with as many skill sets as you can possibly have to have the very open, honest, and frank conversations that have to happen because we don't have a choice. This is not something that we can allow to continue on. Contrary to what I heard yesterday, if you didn't have the full faith and support of the Vermont state government behind this issue, these plans are insolvent now. We have about $5.8 billion of liability out there. We have about $5 billion of assets. Now, some may disagree with me, but that's okay. So we don't have the choice to do nothing. So I, in overall conceptually, totally agree, I think, with what the speaker has come out with. But I want these people starting to get around the table this afternoon, if possible. And I don't want them to be shorted any sort of resources at all, because we have got to give them all the support that they could possibly have to move this thing forward and come up with a viable plan going forward. I will back up a little bit on the governance. Um, 
I'm sure we're going to go back and visit that. I think I'm going to look at this totally different than most of us on the committee here. And I'm sorry, but I may inspire a few emails going forward. But my sincerity is pure and that I want to do what we got to do to make these pensions something that people can depend on and that aren't an issue every 10 years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chair. I feel like you um I feel like you set the table there, but then you didn't tell us what your governance plan is. Are you is that is that is this the big reveal? Are we like are we gonna hear a proposal? Um <laughs> no I, I mean can I well, explore I'm, that I'm, a little more? I'm trying to respect uh, that you had moved us on to to the structure they're at. I mean, I I hadn't heard the speakers, like I said, I had not heard the speakers uh, press conference. And I, contrary to what some people might think, I do try to think about things before I open my mouth, which I know I speak frequently. But, um, you know, if you want to go there, um, I want to have a conference. If we're going to talk about governance, I'm not sure that I think just tweaking this thing around the edges of the current structure is really going to get the job done. Um, I'd like to see, I'd like to have the discussions about totally privatizing, professionalizing, let me rephrase that, professionalizing the investment side of this. Um, this is where I'm going to probably inspire a couple emails, but I'm not sure where I see the value of those that are beneficiaries of these pensions participating in the investment side. I want to see as much of a return as possible on those. And I point to that, I guess what, since 17, it appears that we've got some of the right people in the right places and things are working better. So if you'll take a look at the history over these plans, show me where this current structure has done what we want it to do. I don't think that it has. I think it's absolutely appropriate on the benefit side where those that are the beneficiaries of these plans have input into that. Who knows where this is gonna come up, but if this is just all about tweaking what's there um, I think we owe it to the people who are getting the pensions and those of us who are paying into those pensions to have that open and frank conversation about what would it look like doing it quite differently. Thanks, Rob. Bob thank Hooper. You. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative DeClaire. I, I agree with a lot of what Rob just said. Not everything, but a lot. Um, and, you know, everybody else has had something to say that's been really critical, I think, to the process. Um, it, Mike's point, Representative Mawicki, on the number of people at the table is, is valid for some type of group discussion. But in this particular case, if we don't have everybody at the table, we're going to have the same discussion that we're having right now. It's just going to be a different issue, more fine pointed. Um, this is something that goes to the heart of most people. So they're gonna fight for it as my email box clearly attests to. So I, I fully support the idea of an independent facilitator or chair because you gotta get away from the politics and there is no way to get away from the politics with one of the people that's deeply involved in the ownership of this. Um, there's no way that this goes forward without the treasurer's office or somebody providing an actuary right there at the table that can say, this is where the balloon punches out as long as you're punching on this side, um, because that's what really takes up the time. When we did this in 09, we would give the actuary a charge and because the computers weren't then what the computers are today, they'd have to run it all night and come back the next day. I'm hoping that's not the situation now. Um, but there's, there's, if you don't have participation of everybody in the process, uh, nobody's going to be happy and we'll be back here again arguing about it. The reason that I think the uh, three musketeers set up uh, a plan structure sort of yesterday for the committee was that 
one, the people on this page right now are going to be the ones that come back and implement something. So we should have as much information available that happened, not filtered right in front of us as we need. And, you know, if it's convenient, maybe being able to sit in a room is a good thing. You got to have input from the money committees if you're going to talk about money. And, you know, there are just certain people that really need to be there. Uh, if it's done at a time when, like Rob says, we have a timeline that says you got to have it done by the end of June, pressure is a good thing. A um, lot, of, lot of stuff to agree with here. Thank you. Sam? That's a legacy hand by a comment that was already made. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, Mike. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up on Representative LeClaire's comments with a couple of thoughts that that brought to mind. You know, we, we started out this whole conversation and I think the speaker and you, Madam Chair, have, have said at the beginning of almost every single meeting that we've had, a discussion we've had about pensions, whether it was in public or whether it was here in our committee, that we were starting a conversation and trying to bring people to the table and looking for responses and looking for ideas. Um, and some of those people that we need at the table to move forward on saving Vermont's pensions. And I stay rooted in the idea that we're here to make these pension programs sustainable for the beneficiaries and for the people of Vermont. Some of the people we needed to come and work with us just didn't want to be part of the process or didn't come and weren't here. And the task force, I think, is in response, not just to the proposals we heard yesterday, but in response to the fact, you know, not just what people were asking us, but the fact that the House, our committee, our body, can't solve this problem without some of the other partners that we need at the table. And uh, I wanted to also say that when we think about the words that we use when we describe the current state of the, the system, um, describing them as insolvent right now is really dangerous. They're not insolvent. I mean, I'm not bankrupt because I owe more on my mortgage than I have in my checking account. Right? I know that my earnings are going to allow me to, my future earnings are going to allow me to keep making my mortgage payment. The problem with the pension systems is that that mortgage payment suddenly goes up on the state in years like this. And we're talking about governance reform and we're talking about putting a task force together, scoped, I hope, you to look at the ideas the speaker talked about, getting everything on the table, revenue, plan reforms. Um, and doing that all in the spirit of making sure that for Vermonters and for these public employees that everybody can have confidence. And I 100% agree in the goal of not coming back to this 10 years from now. So uh, that I think is something we can all agree on. Thanks, Mike. Tanya? Thank you. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question because I, I see sometimes the numbers get mixed and then not mixed. And so I, I want someone to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the unfunded liability is, I think, 2.9 billion. And then when you add in the OPEBs, which we could prefund or don't have to prefund, then it becomes that 5.6. But that 5.6 isn't actually the whole, am I, I see John shaking his head. Am I right? I just, I'm trying to clarify because I see these numbers sort of like interchangeably used and yeah. Yeah. So the, the unfunded pension liability is 1.9 billion for the teachers, um, approximately 1 billion um, for the, the state employees. And then the rest of the unfunded liability is OPEP, which equals $5.6 billion, billion. Thank you. Mark? Um, I guess I'm looking at a different figure and I don't know where it came from, but my understanding for the unfunded liabilities just for uh, the teachers uh, program and the VSEA was 3.9 billion. And, and where, am I, where am I going wrong, uh, John? Unmute, John. 
Sorry about that. Uh, I'm double checking, but I, I'm pretty sure those are the numbers, but I will double check right now. Okay. Because I've, I've been using those numbers all along. I've been using be 3.9 billion all along for the, the, the two there. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to say is I, I definitely agree with uh, Rob in the sense of um, uh, having all the resources available. I guess my question there is, uh, does, it, does it matter what the structure of this task force is going to be, whether or not we could use JFO's uh, expertise. I'm just wondering if it if it gets outside of a, a legislative structure enough, um, can they still be involved? I would assume that <clears throat> if we want JFO to be involved, that we need to have this be a task force that is um, run by the legislature. I guess I can I can check on that, but um, uh, but there's there's definitely going to be work that needs to be done that is beyond what JFO can do. We need to have access to an actuary so that we can run different scenarios and uh, and really understand what the long term impact might be of any um, plan design changes or revenue. Right. That's yeah. That's. That's what JFO had even said, which I mentioned yesterday. New plan proposals would have to have an actuarial analysis. So, yep. um, all right, yep, just. Uh, uh, Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I was gonna ask this earlier uh, in the context of questions of you uh, about the uh, portion of the speaker's thoughts for the future uh, in respect to the uh, holding the 150 million extra uh, injection aside uh, or in reserve or uh, whatever uh, sort of words like that. Um, I, at the time, I was going to say, and let me say now because it's come back up again, uh, the pre-funding of OPEB appear, appeared right along to be uh, readily acceptable, agreed to, wise, fiduciarily responsible. Why would we hold off on that until uh, some magical tactical uh, endpoint is reached? I, I, I can't fathom that. I mean, I understand that it's really the speaker's call if there is a strategic purpose to holding the extra money uh, aside. Uh, and I, I don't want to inquire about that at the moment, but. I don't understand why we would uh, postpone a commitment decision, uh, a go ahead to uh, uh, enact the pre-funding, certainly by the end of the fiscal year, if not before. Uh, so that is a wonderful question. And, um, and I thank you for the opportunity to answer it because unless we can put our pension liabilities on a more sustainable path, we will not have, we will not be able to, in good conscience, commit the general fund to paying both the annual ADEC that ballooned by $96 million this year and the annual OPEB prefunding um, bill. We, you know, we've got to get the pension ADEC under control in order to be able to make room in, uh, in the general fund to be able to do both. That's why all four buckets should be on the table at the same time. Um, Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, a couple of things. One, I, I think it's uh, you, Madam Chair, that I'm in total agreement with in that I, I think I heard you say is that I don't think that joint fiscal being involved in this discussion, um, that doesn't work. One, I don't think that they have the time. Two, my understanding is they do not have that particular area of expertise, which I think we desperately need. Um, so one of my questions about this has always been for us to have the conversation that obviously we've had and have to continue. Um, do we have access? Do we have the in-house resources? And I'm pretty sure we don't, for one. 
Um, two, you know, talking about this liability, I mean, I think we can split it any way we want, but the bottom line is, is we're talking about promises that we've made to people, whether it's your pensions or your health care going forward. So I think we have to look at this as a whole number and any change that we make, it's a change and it's a change to the people that we made a promise to. So that's where they have to have the conversation. Now, as far as uh, I think a comment was made about whether it's insolvent or not, I guess that's a matter of how you, what you look at. If you've got more debt than you have assets, um, that's a problem. And for those of us who have gone to financial institutions to borrow some money, um, if I walk in a door with that scenario, I'm walking right back out the door without any, any help. So it's a matter of perspective. And I did say that if you didn't have the full faith and support of the Vermont state government behind us, which you do, um, it would be a very different conversation. But as far as when we start this and who's running our table, I'm gonna reemphasize, I think this thing should start, these folks need to start meeting this afternoon. We don't put on how many times you meet or how long you meet. It's whatever you have to do to work this out because it has to be worked out. Yeah. And I, I agree with you in concept about putting a deadline. Um, I think realistically, we're not gonna be able to put a um, end of the fiscal year deadline, but I do think we should put a deadline that's um, early enough in the, in 2021 that we can be working towards uh, putting that, <clears throat> putting a solution on the table right away in January so that we can move it more directly next year. Can I say one more thing, Madam Chair? Sure. Um, around the pre-funding pre of the OPEB, I totally get that and it makes perfect sense. However, we have never, ever had the conversation around the expense side of the OPEB, which is healthcare costs. Right. And if there is anything, for goodness sakes, that is a, a real topic of discussion, it's healthcare. Um, is the 20 million, is it enough? Um, and until we have an idea of what we're looking at with that, I just don't want to go put $20 million towards something and not know if it's going to do what it needs to do. Because again, it's part of the promise that we've made to people that have been made to people, not we, but thank you. Tanya Vihovsky. Actually, I think that might be a legacy hand. Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess uh, right now I'm in a little bit of a different frame of mind than the speaker when it comes to the $150 million. Um, and I'd maybe like to um, talk about that a little bit more, but uh, I think regardless of, of what happens going forward, that, that money there needs to be committed to, well, uh, again, maybe leaving OPEB out of it, but uh, needs, needs to be committed as soon as possible to, um, to the ADEC. Um, anyway, that's rather than this, this hold off uh, provision. Bob Hooper. Madam Chair, I recently had the Pfizer vaccine and I really don't know what was in it, but I, I fear because I agree once again with Rob and Mark. Um, Quite frankly, most of the discussion we've heard from Beth and other people is that the bond rating stuff is just as much impression as it is actual numbers. Uh, a commitment of putting 20 million bucks towards the OPEB outstanding and getting a recognition that we've done something with the unfunded liabilities makes a difference. Uh, I. I agree, we should move that forward. And it, it, you know, at this point, it just seems like it's being held hostage uh, for anticipated changes. And that, that doesn't seem like prudence, which is a word that gets used a lot when you talk about fiscal uh, responsibility. So 
I would urge us to seek latitude from the speaker to move forward on those two very important things. Um, thank you. Tanya. I remembered what I wanted to say. It wasn't actually a legacy hand. Um, I too am with that 150 million. My understanding is if we invest it today, it grows in interest and pays down that would help to pay down that unfunded liability. So I'm also, I think in agreement that requesting some latitude to get that invested as soon as possible makes sense to me. Mike McCarthy. So the speaker made it really clear that finding that extra $150 million, because it has to be state dollars, you know, it, it can be freed up by the additional revenues we have given everything that's uh, going on with federal money coming in and in this interesting time that we are in with COVID um, is not an easy thing. And, and I heard, you know, Representative Hooper, when we were first talking about OPEB, it seems like years ago, but it was just a few weeks ago when we were talking about pre-funding made a pretty strong case. And I think it was part of why we didn't move forward at that moment that we have four buckets. If you consider the two pension systems and teachers and state employees OPEB and we're asking a task force to come together potentially that kind of seems like where we're going and that's the task that the speaker has put on our committee that we need to give them some tools to be able to provide us with a comprehensive solution to the unfunded liabilities and the pension crisis as we've all been describing it and i think that have that tying the hands of that task force by using that resource up before we even let them get started would be a bad idea. So I think there there's an argument to be made to earn a little bit of additional in, interest if we get a few months head start. Um, but by parking that 150 million, we're giving that task force the opportunity to make some decisions and recommendations that we'll eventually act on in the next session. Mike Berwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I wanna uh, follow through on that thread uh, and, and point out too that uh, what has become apparent in this week is, is we are out on the limb by ourselves. And, and we don't know for sure because we haven't really heard from the administration. We haven't really heard from the Senate and until we do, I think we need to hold on making further decisions. And, and, and I agree with uh, the other MM here that I'm not gonna already tie the hands of a task force before we, we, we get them seated. Uh, so I, I'm not ready to start pushing on that 150 million right now. Mark Higley. So I don't understand uh, Mike and Mike's response in regards to the 150. That's already been voted out of the house in the budget. It's there. It's there's no no hard hard task to find it and get it out there. It's it's there. So, um, and I just again would like to reiterate. It's not my words, but uh, from so-called pension experts that I've been listening to to some degree, uh, the, the number one thing that they talked about was paying down this unfunded liabilities as quickly as possible. Um, and again, I guess the long-term issue is uh, where, where is it all going to come from? But my understanding now is we've got 150 million already in our bill that's over to the Senate. Um, so uh, the other thing, and it just I'm not a very good note keeper. I have to search and search, but uh, I do have a note here that, that talks about the actual amount that it would uh, uh, help reduce the unfunded liability by $459 million. And I, and I don't know the length of time that it would do that, but that's, that's what I have in my notes. And I believe that came from probably the treasurer um, that that $150 million um, should reduce that underfunded liability by 459 million. So it's a start. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just <clears throat> can't resist the temptation to be ironic um, 
half the committee is having a tactical discussion, a strategic discussion, a bargaining discussion. The other half of the committee is having a fiduciary discussion. And the two trains are passing, if you will, um, on different tracks. And I find it ironic because here we are struggling with the governance proposal uh, where we really want them to think and put their fiduciary hats on and leave their tactical and strategic and self-interested um, <laughs> impulses uh, somewhere outside the committee room uh, or the board room or the task force room or commission room. And so we, here we are, we can't put our fiduciary hats on for whatever reason, uh, but we're here to s essentially try to create a fiduciary bo a body, which is uh, somewhat independent in Galanka's sense of the word, uh, and it will not be um, dissuade um, in that task, uh, unlike us politicians or legislators who, who seem to be stuck between the two. Thanks. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. This will, God, I hope this will be the last time I speak. Um, <laughs> I stuck a note in the, in the chat, but I, I think it's important and want to bring it to the, the table. Uh, we were also talking at one point about capturing the premium holiday money and redirecting that to OPEB. And I don't think we should let that fall out of our view. Those things are scheduled for late in the year already. So if we don't do something, that money will be lost. And, you know, I think we need to really, Peter brought up a really good point, which hat we're wearing here. And the fiduciary hat says, if we commit the 150 million or 130, because my conversations with uh, Hooper number one is that that money, the 20 million is definitely directed toward OPED, is for the 130 that's left, it'll be an immediate reduction of the liability. It'll reduce the ADEC for next year immediately, and it will have an opportunity to grow. So from the standpoint of that, uh, using this to leverage something else, uh, it kind of is not in the state's overall best interest. So uh, again, I think that's something that we should talk about with maybe somebody that actually knows uh, the difference in dollars and cents about whether we put it forward or we hold it back. Thank you. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I know yesterday we heard the proposal where they uh, had their suggestion of who they'd like on a committee. Um, and Tanya said we heard it twice. It can can I get reminded of where the other list was? Because um, I like to like I'd like to cross and compare. Maybe we all could do that, or maybe we could have a suggestion of like a like a survey from our end of like who we think should be there. Like just to try to get some of the stuff broken out. I know uh, Representative Eclair said they like get this done sooner than later, but even if we are just having the option of just brainstorming something, I feel if we were in person, we would all have a thing on a board, we'd write who would be there, we start, you know, crossing or circling or moving people, and I feel like that work we could do remotely also, um, of just trying to see the names, see things on paper or electronically, and just try to get this list moving of um, even see who we should have on this task force. Um, so I know of the one yesterday from the suggestion and do we know the other list that we were looking at of the suggestion for the task force? I think the first place that I would look is, has this been done in the past and who sat at the table the last time and was it successful and was it the right balance and did everybody have a voice in the process and then I would also just take to heart the uh, the suggestions that have been made about making sure that this group is adequately resourced with the financial technical actuarial um, uh, expertise and uh, and then we should talk about whether uh, whether this is a facilitated process or whether this is um, a task that we will designate the facilitators. So um, I have not had time to go back and look at the last time we had a, an interim 
uh, conversation around uh, pension issues, but um, I'm hoping that we will have a chance to do a little bit of that research this afternoon since we don't have committee or floor. And I'll wasn't there a small one before COVID? Sorry, wasn't there a small one before COVID struck? Wasn't Rep Gannon, didn't she mention that there was a small one? Oh yeah, that was, a, that was a narrow focused one, but John, go ahead and remind us what that was. Um, I don't recall everybody was on it, but I'd be glad to provide information on that. Also back in 2009, there was a retirement commission. I know that report still exists, but I think we can find the, the names and um, individuals that were in, involved in both those efforts. Let's see if we can get those up and get them added as documents on our committee page under this committee discussion today so that anyone who's watching along um, can also browse that over the weekend since it's not gonna be warm enough to go out and rake the lawn very much this weekend. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you. I can answer the lists I was talking about, Sam, were the Workers' Center and VSEA proposals both offered up some people that should be at the table that I thought should be in that process. Um, I also had a question about, and I'm, I'm really attempting to understand, um, and also probably being maybe too hopeful, but with the OPEBs, if, if we pre-funded those completely and say past universal health care, where would all that money go? Because we would no longer have to pay for um, people's health care. So I, I'm just, yeah, sorry, really new with that. That'd be a fun problem to have. <laughs> I'm just trying to, to understand. When it's our job to figure out what to do with all of that OPEB money, because we finally figured out what every other country in the world has figured out and that is collectively funding healthcare actually makes sense but and it doesn't just go away like we would then get that money back like because sometimes you know you buy something and you bought it the money's gone i'm just trying to make sure that that's not, it's not a creating a liability because i have hopes that someday we will figure out what every other country has figured out and how to collectively fund healthcare. <laughs> and cue rob leclaire <laughs> well, i just want to make sure that our charge is clear here that we're not looking to tackle the universal health care issue along with pensions as well. I just want to and know where that money just, would go. And just one clarifying, I'm not sure there's any health care that is free. Somebody pays somewhere. Absolutely, but we would no longer need to pre-fund OPEBs and do we just lose the money that we've put into pre-funding that if healthcare is coming from another source? This is what I'm trying to understand. Fair question. One other comment is I'm assuming the, and I'm saying the word assume here, but the 150 million or whatever monies are earmarked for this, I would hope the treasurer or whoever would have that in some sort of interest bearing type of an account um, so that it does continue to grow while the conversation is taking place. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Absolutely. Two and a half percent. <clears throat> no, oddly enough, it's under the management of VPIC. So, <laughs> well, you give me 150 million, I bet I can get you better than two and a half percent. I say, wouldn't it grow more? in the actual accounts? Like, what is the return on that, seven? 16 at this point. Okay, so we have a couple of um, areas that we will focus on next week. Um, and I am hoping that folks with ideas and suggestions will send them along via email over the weekend um, so that we can hopefully get some of these ideas drafted and begin working towards the passage of a bill that will get this issue uh, on its way. Peter Anthony, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you yourself or the Vice Chair would remind me, in the, the, uh, under the rubric of governance, would we be talking about the kinds of responsibility for making decisions which are currently part of VPEC? And what I'm thinking of is the, the very strong emphasis on singular focus on investments. But part of that, as I recall, 
would also be uh, bringing perhaps uh, more voices to the conversation, but uh, settling on um, a um, assumed rate of return. Uh, and again, I, I wanted to go away this weekend and think about all the things that could possibly change. And I was thinking about the requirement currently of unanimity in the assumed rate of return. And I, I'm not sure, uh, I, I know of almost no institution that requires unanimity, but I don't know whether VPEC has a primary or leadership or um, whatever kind of superior view um, or not. And should, should I be thinking of the setting of any, any benchmarks, and I'll use the wider world, um, in, in the process of thinking about governance and who would vote, et cetera. Thank you. So I think I would um, try to take the principles of what was presented by Tom Galanka and Beth Pierce yesterday and, um, and put that uh, into bill form as a starting point and then hear reactions from other folks about what's missing or what should be included. Um, I think the question of full independence of VPIC is probably one that makes more sense to leave to that um, to that RFP that they've put out um, to, to study future possible actions. Um, but I think the beefing up of the governance process is probably one that we can all agree on right now. I, if you pardon me, I just didn't hear them say anything about uh, the benchmarks, that is to say the expected rate of return. Maybe I missed it, um, but remind me, I mean, is was that something they assumed would continue to remain primarily with VPEC or not in their yes. proposal. John, you want to answer that? Having Yep. So um, their proposal is that VPIC would have sole responsibility for setting the actuarial assumptions, including the investment rate of return, inflation rate, smoothing method used for calculation, actuarial valuation of assets or returns. Good, thank you. That's crystal clear. Great. Um, LeClaire. So just for clarification, Madam Chair, you're, we're, the, the focus and emphasis is going to be on VPIC, at least initially, as opposed to looking at the whole government structure? Um, by whole governance structure, you mean the interaction of VPIC with the system boards and the treasurer's office? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think if, if I, you know, if you take what John Gannon just said, yes, it's looking at VPIC, but it's also um, changing slightly the relationship between VPIC and the system boards. And then I would suggest that further study about reorganization of that structure, um, particularly with respect to independence and whether they have their own staff and are their own entity versus having staff within the treasurer's office uh, can be left for that, that further investigation. That helps, thank you. All right, anything else folks have been mulling over with respect to governance or a task force that we should get on the table here before we adjourn for the day. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, I lied. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that in the context of governance, uh, one of the things that should be at least looked at is the separation of the treasurer's office from the VFIC structure. That's something that's been up for discussion. It's going to be up for discussion in this uh, best practice survey that's going to be done. So information is going to be available to us. Uh, and in terms of moving into the future, not a bad thing to talk about. Hal Colston. You need to unmute. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I, I'm just wondering, how does oversight fit into this conversation about governance? 
because I think that's something that's missing. And um, do we do we put it on the table now, or is it something that's separate that has to be addressed? But I think you know there needs to be some kind of check and balance in, in this new governance model. I think so. Yeah, that's a really good point that you bring up um, because I. I feel uncomfortable about having had this problem set on our laps and realizing that in retrospect, there have been, there have been mistakes that have been being made for the last 10 years and we haven't been aware enough of them. And so um, I think it's worth having a discussion about what does that oversight look like? And John Gannon, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, I, I thank Cal for raising that because that's something I've been thinking about as we started to focus on governance. Um, what type of legislative oversight um, should there be um, with respect to this whole process? Because the chair is absolutely right. We do not want to go back um, to where we were and see a decade of mistakes before we focus on it. Um, mm -hmm. So as with many things, um, the legislature does set up oversight um, committees or, or panels um, that are regularly tasked with focusing on a specific issue, in this case, pensions. Because as, as we all know, especially the folks that have been here for more than one term, it's very hard for a policy committee to stay focused on a single issue year in, year out, um, because we have so many bills that we're working on, new priorities come up, um, and, and it's really hard. Like next year, we're gonna be focused on redistricting. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's one thing that we may want to consider in the overall governance. Thanks, Hal and John. Thank you. Flag that. Um, Mike Merwicki. Thanks. And I just wanted to clarify that, in fact, Hal was um, speaking about our oversight of the legislative oversight uh, to be to be brought into the picture. I, I think that. That was confirmed with what I later heard from Hal and with John. Is that accurate, Hal? Yes, absolutely. If I may, Madam Chair, that's I was trying to tease that from Mr. Galanka and the consultant when I asked about the tension between accountability and independence. And the only re response, as I recall, I got was uh, his emphasis on independence from political interference, but. But I was thinking, like Hal was, of the uh, 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 bedrock responsibility uh, that, that really is vested only in the legislature for being accountable to it and then in turn to the citizens of Vermont. Thanks. Tanya? Thanks, Madam Chair. John, when you talk about an oversight board like that, do you have a vision for what that would look like and who would be on it? Or am I like a thousand years ahead of where we actually are? Um, I think, you know, I've just started to think about this over the last couple of days. Um, I know there are, are oversight models that the legislature has set up for other issues. Um, so that would be the first place I would look, but I haven't, I haven't done that research at this point. Awesome, thank you. Other thoughts or questions or suggestions? I'm glad we uh, stuck around long enough to, to spend a moment talking about oversight and ongoing oversight because you know the, the urgency of this moment is, uh, is in no small part due to the fact that um, this is an issue that doesn't tend to uh, t doesn't tend to get brought up until we have a raging problem and it, it certainly is uh, worthwhile thinking about whether we could do a better job of heading off um, urgent or tragic um, conversations by, uh, by having some more regular oversight. Peter. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I mentioned this very much in passing a couple, three weeks ago, but in my other experience on a money committee, uh, made an indelible impression because in the first or second week, I got a stack of um, both electronic and paper versions of reports that, for instance, the tax department was required to submit 
Uh, and it essentially dealt with mostly what's happening with programs that forgive taxes called tax expenditures, current use, that kind of stuff. And we, we at that time constantly were, were monitoring what was it that we were not collecting that we could have collected if we changed the rules. And it's that kind of mandatory, in your face, uh, uh, set of documents, uh, whether electronic or in paper, that would greet the committee when it is gaveled in, in January, if the timing is right. Again, I realize some of the reporting and information gathering may not fit that exact schedule, but, it, but it's sort of like, here's what VPIC owes, the oversight body. Whether the oversight body is uh, government ops or not is, I suppose, uh, a, a matter yet to be decided, but, but it's the transmission of the key um, metrics measured against how's it going, what's happening, uh, that, that uh, it would be mandatory as I, as I remember the process when I came to it anew. Thank you. Any other thoughts from committee members? All right. Well, I welcome you to continue um, your your research and continue to talk with others uh, in your communities and uh, and in your caucuses and send your ideas uh, my way. And we will pick this up again when we get back into committee on Tuesday afternoon. Anything else before we adjourn for the day? All right. Thank you for your hard work this week. Uh, thank you for being good conduits from uh, your communities and your constituents to the legislature to help us figure out how we move forward. It has, uh, it has been a, a bumpy couple of weeks, um, but I think we have found a way to, to bring this in for landing. Thank you.